from uh, Sripath. I want to thank uh, Krishna for, for agreeing to give this talk. Uh, it's obviously a topical area. There is a lot of interest, as we've seen from the number of people who have signed up to actually join and participate in this webinar. Um, so I'm going to hand over to you, Krishna, if you want to go through. And um, if you've got any questions as we go through the presentation, please feel free to write them in the chat. Don't, don't unmute yourself. Just write the, the questions in the chat and I'll have a look at those and, and we'll find a, an opportunity to just get some of those questions answered at the end. OK, now over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gordon. Um, um, really, it's a, it's a big honor to be able to uh, present our webinar to, to the faculty and uh, staff and indeed uh, uh, quite a gathering that you have assembled. Um, I did a little bit of research. Well, what do you expect a nerd to do on uh, Nottingham? Uh, and some really famous uh, people have passed through the portals, uh, certainly Nobel Prize winners, um, uh, you know, professional athletes, medaled athletes at the Olympics, um, and you know, people lettered in the arts, uh, including the creator of a comic book series. But uh, interestingly enough, I found uh, the current head of the MI6 is a alum of Nottingham. So uh, I usually, in, in conversations with my... Uh, American counterparts, um, you know, jokingly sometimes say that only they, me and the uh, NSA in the wake of the Patriot Act, only they, me and the NSA is listening in. But I guess we can add uh, MI6 to that list. Uh, it is not our fame that precedes us. It's probably our notoriety. Uh, thank you again. And today we'll be talking about uh, uh, rap mixes. Um, what really are the benefits of, of recycling? What's the impetus for, for wrap mixes? Um, then we'll move on to um, a, a more practical guide. Uh, what is wrap? What are the common uh, quality uh, parameters? What do you look for? Um, and then move on to a little bit about rejuvenators. What are they? How do they work? How do you select one? Um, some uh, property data, et cetera, on uh, roadway performance and durability. Uh, then leading on to what's the economic impact of, of high wrap mixes. Uh, finally, you've done all of this, a little bit of um, uh, introduction to what you should be looking for, um, for the plant operator really, for the plant manager, what you should be looking for in terms of implementing all these ideas in a, in a mixed plant. So um, just a very brief introduction. Uh, Shripath makes a range of products, uh, rejuvenators, polymers, compatibilizers, uh, anti-strip agents, etc. Our focus is on environmentally uh, friendly, environmentally sustainable type uh, products that are user friendly, uh, durable, uh, cost effective. Uh, we are a global company. I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, we have a couple of uh, questions uh, that we pose to the audience. Here's how you respond uh, on your laptop or on your mobile. And don't worry, these instructions will come up uh, when we hopefully when we go through the, uh, let me unlock this. That's how you respond to them. Again, uh, just by way of introduction, completely anonymous. Uh, what we do is, please go ahead and, and enter your responses. Uh, what we do is we make a number of these presentations um, around the world, really, and we use these responses that we get to calibrate our uh, presentation um, to tell to really tailor it much more for the for the audience uh, uh, in mind. So please go ahead and and fill in the responses as you go ahead. Um, <coughs> as I mentioned, Shripath is a is a global company. Today you'll see a lot of data from uh, around the world, um, and uh, we have offices in uh, in Melbourne, Australia, in uh, Mumbai, India, uh, certainly London, UK, uh, North America for sure, uh, and some fine agents in uh, Russia, South Africa, um, and um, and and really uh, South America, uh, China, etc. Uh, I see we have a heavy European contingent. That's uh, not quite unexpected, um, with a smattering from uh, North America and South America. Asia too. Wow. OK, welcome to all. Thank you so much for taking time uh, to walk through this and um, I will move on to the um, to the next question we have again. As I said, uh, this is more of a calibration check for us. Please go ahead and enter your responses uh, for us. We do uh, present uh, these kinds of seminars um, uh, worldwide and and it does help us to understand the, the composition of the audience and 
uh, what particular uh, kind of areas they may be interested in. Uh, it's not unusual for us to find a lot of uh, engineering firms uh, and, and regulatory agency, uh, industry association type people, uh, university type people. One of the things we do is no matter which part of the world we go, uh, we talk to local experts, local uh, professors, um, local uh, Department of Transportation officials, and uh, you know, try to to test uh, our materials according to local specifications, local norms, local practices. So as I mentioned, you'll see a lot of this uh, throughout the uh, uh, the presentation today in terms of compliance or property data on on a wide variety of um, uh, of situations and circumstances from around the globe. Uh, thank you again for participating uh, in these uh, couple of introductory type uh, questions. Uh, let me move on and, and start laying the groundwork for what we really need to talk about today. Um, you've all seen figures like this, um, intersecting circles, intersecting triangles, uh, driving towards a net zero uh, central nexus. How does all of this apply in the case of um, pavement materials? In the reuse category, um, certainly uh, we'll talk about uh, reclaimed asphalt pavement, uh, but tires and concrete are also uh, quite uh, prevalent as uh, materials uh, used in this industry. And by the way, uh, just uh, a quick disclaimer, uh, you will find a lot of American uh, colloquialisms and American spellings uh, in this. And yes, I do admit tires is spelled wrong here. Um, in the uh, you know reduction of energy, reduction of emissions, uh, there are any number of important technologies that are being employed. Certainly, warm mixed bitumen is used to lower pavement laydown and pavement compaction temperature. Uh, if you want to eliminate the hot mix part completely, uh, bitumen emulsions uh, have certainly gained traction uh, for patching, repair type work. Cold mixes are increasingly in vogue. Uh, and finally, we'll spend some time on this. Uh, one of the big avenues available for this industry is in the reduction uh, of materials that we extract, either refine oil to produce bitumen or uh, reduce mountains uh, to, to aggregate. We'll talk about some of that in more detail today. Finally, all of that is useful. It's neat, it's nice, but it really needs to lead to an improved or at least equivalent service life. There's no point doing all of this uh, if you're uh, re-repairing your roads uh, quite frequently. And there are any number of technologies and, and methodologies available to improve service life. Certainly mechanistic design uh, principles are more in vogue today. Uh, more advanced um, characterization and grading of the incoming materials, the bitumen, uh, or even the uh, the mix uh, in terms of balanced mix design. And finally, modified bitumen material has certainly uh, um, become pretty prevalent uh, in many parts of the world where it leads to improved uh, service life by reducing raveling, reducing rutting, improving fatigue life, and so on and so forth. So as I mentioned, we'll talk about uh, RAP. Uh, the UN did a study uh, and, uh, and uh, proclaimed uh, that as populations grow, uh, one of the key indicators of GDP growth is growth in, in roadway network structure. Otherwise, you have bottlenecks uh, developing. And as a consequence of all this road widening, new road building, repairing of old roads, uh, we are generating a lot of wrap, over 750 million tons of wrap. I think this was year 2020. And only about 20% of that was being wrap was being reused in pavements and that too as a, as a low value add um, a filler in a mix. The rest, 80% shipped off to, to landfill. And this is a key area that, that we need to focus on if we are to drive towards sustainability targets as an industry. Um, we need to reduce the amounts of materials that we're mining or we're drilling for oil. Uh, and we need to learn to better use the wrap material for the constituents uh, that compose it. In other words, can we use that aggregate in the wrap? Can we use the bitumen in that wrap and thereby reduce uh, the strains that we put uh, on, on the resources of the earth? So what is the case for using high wrap mixes? It really, there are two, uh, two uh, foundation pillars on which it rests. The first is economic and the second is environmental. So let's first talk about the economic use. This data comes to us uh, courtesy 
of FHWA, the Federal Highway Administration, and they were looking at the various cost inputs into every square kilometer, every uh, lane kilometer or lane mile uh, of roadway laid down. Uh, and they concluded that over 70% of the cost was in the materials. So anything we can do to put a dent in this 70% is going to have a meaningful impact on the total cost of, of that uh, lane mile or lane kilometer. And we will show how rap, uh, high wrap usage can exactly do some of that. The other leg, as I mentioned, of this uh, thrust towards high wrap mixes is environmental. This data comes to us uh, courtesy of the uh, Australian Flexible uh, Pavement Association. And they were looking at the greenhouse gas emissions systematically across different percentages of wrap, 10, 20, 30, 40, uh, et cetera. Uh, and really, this top line is the bottom line for this graph. Um, systematically, they found out that as you increase RAP, you're reducing the uh, greenhouse gas emission. And they, they broke it down quite well into component raw materials, transport, heating, mix production. This data is as of the mix gate, uh, the gate of the mix producer, the asphalt mix producer. And as you can see, the, the kilogram of uh, carbon dioxide per ton emission uh, is systematically lower as you increase the wrap content. So let's tie it all back together and lay the groundwork for what we are about to talk today um, from your perspective, from the uh, from the various people assembled in the room. What are the different factors? Um, uh, what are the safety issues in paving? Um, what is the most cost effective wrap content uh, to, to minimize uh, environmental emissions? From an economic uh, perspective, what are the cost savings um, associated with RAP usage? And again, the same question, what is the most effective RAP content for you? Uh, finally, from a performance standpoint, again, some of the same questions, you made a mix with the uh, high RAP mixes, how long will it last? Will it last, will it age faster? Because you've got more RAP in it. And finally, the same question again, at what level of RAP does a recycled roadway perform best? I ask this question again and again because towards the end of the talk, it will become clear to you the answer, it it, um, it seems, varies based on your experiences, your needs, and, and, and really your situation. So there is no one universal answer. It is based on your circumstances, and we'll walk through some of the factors that you may identify uh, that are important to you as we walk through this presentation. So with that, um, let's go through the um, through the steps um, of of how to utilize wrap. And again, this is a a fairly simple chart. Uh, with any new material, you're probably going through going to go through some of the same steps. How do you source and how do you prepare the wrap? Um, how do you test uh, the material? How do you finalize a mix design that you can test in the lab? And finally. You've done all of this. How do you incorporate into into your mix plant? Let's walk through the steps. Before I get there, it needs to be acknowledged. And again, this is not new information to pretty much everybody in the room. This has been true since the times that the Egyptians mixed straw with clay and put down roadways, or the Romans put down long roadways on multiple continents uh, in their colonial quests. Really, we're talking about different regimes or temperature ranges of interest of performance of these pavement materials. At the low end, at the low temperature end, you have thermal cracking. Uh, intermediate temperature, you need to minimize fatigue cracking. High temperature, you need to minimize rutting and raveling on your roads. And finally, we all have to acknowledge that these mixes have to be made before they can be put down. So there's a really high temperature regime of performance where it has to have acceptable viscosity, acceptable stability, acceptable flash point, and so on and so forth. So what are the sources of RAP? Um, again, all of you are familiar with this. Just a quick recital. Pavement milling, the two inch 50 millimeter uh, mill and fill type job generates RAP. Removal of pavement completely, both the cap or the wear layer and the base course generates a lot of RAP. Plant waste material. The consequence of generating wrap from all these materials is that you get an extremely variable uh, gradation, sub-size, particle size uh, gradation. Your goal is to take this material and reduce it to a much more uniform type material that can be an input into your raw material uh, operations. How do you do that? 
Well, you start with screening. You remove the uh, foreign matters uh, from your wrap. Next step, you crush it. You take the big rocks and make them into smaller aggregate size uh, uh, materials. Third step, you fractionate. You've got this pile, you separate them by size. In this case, I've shown coarse, medium, and fine. And the reason for that is in general, it is found that if you want to move to higher and higher wrap percentages, you need to be able to fractionate the material. In other words, the number of fractions that you make of your wrap will limit the amount of wrap that you can put into your mix. And we'll talk reasons why later on. Finally, you've done that, you've fractionated it, and this is perhaps one of the most important steps. You take your wrap pile and using an earth mover, you turn it over a couple of times because I think everybody in this room recognizes that if you walked into a freshly milled wrap pile, um, pulls a sample from one region, you'll get an entirely different and analyze it you may get an entirely different region uh, result than if you pulled a sample from the same pile from a different reason. And that is the reason you want to homogenize this pile so as to be able to, uh, to, um, to have a very consistent incoming material. By the way, attribution, this is D'Angelo's data, a, a compilation of D'Angelo's data, Hussein Bahia's data uh, that we've used to assemble the previous two slides. So let's move on and ask, um, how do you actually do this in a lab? Um, again, very simple. You take your stockpile aggregate, you take your wrap aggregates that you created those different piles of, you dry mix them. You dry mix them in order to make sure that you understand the gradation and you settle your wrap content based on how you're able to meet the gradation spec that your specifying authority has laid down for you. Remember, I told you previously, typically, if you have more wrap piles, coarse, medium, fine, you'll be able to incorporate more and more wrap in order to meet your gradation spec. Next step, you take your wrap binder, you take your virgin binder, you take your rejuvenator, you combine them. This is extracted wrap binder. You combine them and meet your liquid spec. What are your virgin, what are your bitumen, incoming bitumen specs that you're uh, Department of Transportation has laid out for you. Based on this, you're now ready to, to make your mix design, and now you're ready to test in the lab. We all know the, the typical tests that you do on incoming materials for aggregates and for, for virgin binder. What are some of the tests that you would do on wrap binder? Well, you check the wrap pile for gradation. You, you, you classify it according to particle size. You check it for um, extracted bitumen, how much of wrap content, how much of bitumen content is there in the wrap, and what is the grade or what is the quality of that wrap bitumen. So you've done all that. Now you begin to ask the question, I've made these mixes, how do I evaluate them? How do I know what is good? And there are a couple of different approaches to this. I'll outline them all. Uh, the first is at the first level, you make a mix design and you ask yourself, how do I how do I characterize the mix? In general, volumetrics don't apply in a situation like this. So you tend to fall back on what's known as balanced mix design. In balanced mix design, you're looking to seek a compromise, seek an optimum point between two competing properties, how stiff it is versus how soft it is. The stiffer it is, the much better it is in, in rutting properties, but it's quite poor in crack resistance, fatigue resistance, damage tolerance type situations. If it's too soft, it has very good damage tolerance properties, but it, the material may have a tendency to rut or ravel. How do you measure these properties for rutting? So basically it's pick one property from one test from column A, one test from column B, and we'll walk through some examples as to what that really means. Column A is rutting. You're looking at any one of these tests, the Hamburg test, the APA test, the French rut wheel test, the Cooper, even the Cantabro works. Fracture toughness, any number of different tests. Texas overlay is a fatigue type test, SCB, semicircular beam bend, SENB, single edge notch beam bending. And like that, you have IFIT, DCT, ideal CT, sometimes even martial stability and flow uh, have been uh, incorporated here. Really, it's an alphabet soup. And, and it depends on what your lab is set up for, what your prior history demonstrates. 
Um, and, and you measure these two properties. How do you know what is good? Very simple. You have a roadway that's performing already. You have a history, 10, 20, 30 year history of mixes that have been put down with low wrap or no wrap. Test them and determine what kind of properties you need for rutting and what kind of properties you need for fracture toughness that has served you well in the past. And this is exactly the procedure that Tom Bennett at Rutgers employed when it came to my, my own home state, the great state of New Jersey, when he set out to devise what is the performance criteria needed for high level wrap mixes. He examined a range of different materials over the decades, so to speak, and came up with criteria and basically said, I don't care what you put in your mix. It could be low wrap, it could be medium wrap, it could be high wrap. In the end, it has to meet these properties. And that's how we came in at uh, balanced mix design. That is evaluating the properties and trying to decide uh, what works from a mix design perspective. There's also a school of thought that says we should look at the liquids, at the bitumen, and determine dosage um, uh, level for rejuvenators based on bitumen data. The first part of this comes courtesy of the EAPA, and they were looking at softening point and penetration. They did it as a rejuvenator, as a percentage of a wrap binder. You could do it as a function of that. You could do it as a function of mixed wrap plus virgin binder. Really, whatever works for you. And what you're looking for is the sweet spot in softening points, sweet spot in penetration, and that will tell you your dosage of rejuvenator that you should be using for your mix. The other way to look at this, and this comes to us courtesy of Australians, Ostrodes, uh, they are looking at viscosity. Using the Chevron equations, again, a very similar procedure. You are looking to find out what is the target range, what is the sweet spot in terms of viscosity for your liquid bitumen to perform in the presence of wrap binder and in the presence of virgin binder. And so it's simply a dosage calibration curve based on viscosity. I must also point out, and I don't have examples of this, but in North America, again, people use, some people use, some states use liquid binder testing. And in that case, they tend to focus on PG high grade and PG low grade. Some people target the rejuvenator dosage based on high grade, and some people target rejuvenator dosage based on low grade. Both these are, are acceptable. It generally it turns out that if you target the high grade, the high, the high temperature properties like softening point or PG high grade or something like that versus a low temperature property, let's say like a frost breaking point or a PG low grade, in general, if you target the high grade to determine your rejuvenation content, you tend to overestimate the amount of rejuvenator needed for the, for the actual mix. And remember in the previous chart, I said you're balancing properties, you're also balancing cost. And so if you start using higher amount of rejuvenators, well, the company accountant would like a word with you in a back room. So we, we walked through how to uh, make a mixed design for the lab. The question now is, how do you pick a good rejuvenator? Uh, and before you do that, let's ask the question, what is it in the wrap that is really changing from a virgin uh, mix? It is well acknowledged that ag aggregates do not change. And so if you had an aggregate that was compliant with specs, let's say five years ago, when you put down the road, and it could be a simple LA abrasion type test or other tests that you use, it, chances are very good that it is still acceptable for use on the roadway. What is changing is the binder. Obviously, the binder is oxidizing. It changes chemically. It changes physically. Binders become more stiff, more brittle, and you need a rejuvenator to be able to restore the binder. Let me make, let me digress for a moment and, and point out that when you add a rejuvenator to a wrap binder, you're not getting chemically molecule for molecule. You're not getting what you had, let's say, from the binder five years ago. What you're looking to do is rebalance, refunctionalize the aged bitumen binder so that it displays properties that are acceptable to you today. That's really what rejuvenation is all about. It's not a chemical transformation. It's more a trans transformation of uh, properties. So how does bitumen age in the field? Courtesy um, University of Wisconsin. 
they extracted cores uh, from different roadways as a function of life of pavement and looked at penetration. This is how it ages. Penetration is one value. You can use other tests like low temperature properties. You can use other tests like LAS fatigue. They all will show roughly the same decay, Arrhenius type decay, simplistically speaking, uh, in properties as a function of time. So this is what you're looking to remedy. This is what you're looking to rectify. In the beginning, and this this is goes back a while, initially the thought was all you needed to do uh, was to soften the binder, the wrap binder. Increasingly, there's been an understanding that you, yeah, you need to reduce the viscosity, but you also need to rebalance the properties as well as restore some modicum of aging properties to the wrap binder. That is how I guess it's been an evolution in thinking. Um, these are some of the rejuvenators that have been tried and are being tried. Um, Software grade bitumen, I'm sure everybody in the room is familiar with those. Uh, and it, again, this too, this listing too reflects a thinking, an evolution in thinking as rejuvenation has gained more mainstream. High uh, wrap mixes have become more and more mainstream. There has been a, a, a thinking um, as evolution in thinking as we've gone along. Initially, we looked at softer grade bitumen. Um, some people use uh, petroleum based um, rejuvenators. They could be aromatic, they could be naphthenic, they could be proprietary oils. Um, used cooking oil, the, the fries that you make uh, for uh, fish and chips, that too has been tried. Um, and then re-refined engine oil bottoms. This is when you uh, take in your car for uh, repair uh, to, 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 to change out the oil. The old oil is sent back to a factory. They put it through distillation towers. They get back, well, fresh motor oil that they sell back to you. And what's left at the bottom uh, of that distillation tower is called re-refined engine oil bottom. That too has been used. Finally, there is a whole class of bio-based uh, blends that are available in the marketplace today. These are on purpose manufactured blends made with virgin uh, type materials. They all have a place. There is no good answer. There's no wrong answer. There's no right answer. They all have their place. They all have some strengths, they all have some limitations, but in general, uh, people tend to drive towards more dosage efficient solutions uh, and more cost effective solutions based on their local situation, based on their local specifications and so on. So this is just a, a waterfall chart of what we discussed um, earlier. Um, what is what does your what do you expect your rejuvenator to do? Does it soften the bitumen? Yes, move on. Does it adjust the properties? Yes, move on. Does it help with compaction of stiff wrap mixes? Yes, and this is the final step that is increasingly gaining traction. Does it aid durability? Does it perform long term? Um, and so really there are some expectations of a rejuvenator. I'll talk about it in a minute as to what you expect your rejuvenator to do. But this is a schematic of um, uh, of what happens again. It's a simplistic uh, schematic uh, of what happens in rejuvenation. You've got this wrap particle. Uh, the rejuvenator is supposed to rejuvenate that that aged bitumen particle. I want to focus on a couple of things and I'll come back to it later. When you use it in a filler type situation, let's say less than 20 percent, you're really expecting that wrap particle to be a black rock. It is not contributing meaningfully to the properties at all. Once you rejuvenate it, up to 100%, and I want to focus on this up to part later on. Um, sometimes simplistically, the assumption is made that 100% of the wrap available in bitumen is available to me after modification through a rejuvenation process is available to me as a rejuvenated bitumen that can contribute. The answer sometimes is yes, the answer sometimes is no, but it may surprise many of you in this room uh, to find out um, Oh wow! Somebody is really fast on the trigger. Um, let me let me introduce this again. Uh, anonymous responses, uh, as I mentioned to you, uh, we just want to find out the reasons why you're looking at uh, rejuvenation. So while the answers are populating, let me tell you what uh, some of the expectations of of ideal rejuvenators are. Which is, it should very rapidly penetrate into the wrap particle. It should be able to functionally rebalance the properties. It should be able to promote long-term durability. 
it should be able to aid stiff uh, compaction of, of stiff mixes. So there are any number of um, parameters that you may want to consider as you go about your rejuvenator selections. Um, just looking through the through the answers again, um, nothing very um, nothing very earth shaking here. There is certainly concern about the environment, um, lower cost of mixes um, for R and D type projects. Um, so yeah, it's uh, some of these same reasons uh, that we've noticed pretty much uh, around the world, um, which is first an emphasis on um, environmental aspects. A second, a desire to reduce the mountains of rack that we're generating worldwide. Uh, and third, certainly, uh, you know, lower cost uh, mixes. So let's uh, step forward um, and ask ourselves, um, what is the impact of high wrap mixes? What kind of properties do they provide? Um, and a general disclaimer here, um, you're going to see a number of case studies and uh, they're going to be um, using Relixer, our rejuvenator. Uh, this is certainly not an advertisement, it's just the data we have. So um, please bear with me as we cycle through a number of case studies that begin to outline in hard data the principles that we've laid down before. I always like to start with this slide because no matter where you are in the world, um, there are elements of this that gain traction um, with, with uh, different folks. If you're in uh, Australia or India, you tend to look at the viscosity column and say, yeah, I can relate to that. Folks in North America look at high PG grade, low PG grade, and are able to, to relate to that. Uh, folks in Europe, penetration, softening point, and so on and so forth. Busy chart. Uh, dense amount of data. So let me just uh, take a moment and, and walk you guys through this. Let's look at mix one. Mix one A has 40% wrap, no rejuvenator. Mix one B has the same 40% wrap with 0.28% by weight of rejuvenator. This is extracted data. You make your mix, you extract your bitumen, and you look for all these properties. Let's focus on viscosity. We're able to see that your viscosity is reduced almost from about 9,000 to about 3,000. Let's look at uh, PG low grade, something that folks in New Zealand or USA may look at or Canada may look at. You're taking this material, which had a minus 14 grade and reducing it to a minus 22, which is quite a common grade across much of North America. Look at the penetration value. You had a stiff penetration of 16 you're able to get it to the 30 plus range. That is, again, quite familiar uh, to folks in Europe, folks in UK, and so on. As you move down from mix one to two to three to four, what's changing is what's known as ABR, or the recycled bitumen content. What that means is that how much of the total liquids in your mix is coming from recycled content. So in this case, it's about 45%. You start increasing it to 50, 60, and mix four has 80 plus percent of the total liquids is coming from recycled bitumen content. So let's look at mix 4A. Mix 4A, 80 plus percent of recycled bitumen content as a function of the total uh, bitumen, 0% rejuvenator. Mix 4B, about 1% of rejuvenator, same 80%, 80 plus percent of recycled material content. What is the impact on properties? Extracted bitumen data, you can see that the viscosity from an almost chewing gum like 48,000 is now reduced by 90%, more in line with typical, you know, elastomeric modified bitumens that you are able to compact in the field. Look at the low temperature grade. Again, it's taking a very stiff material and getting it to almost a, better than a minus 22. Again, quite commonly used. Look at the penetration. For an almost zero pen material, you're reducing, you're increasing the softness to about a 30 plus pen, which again is in line with what you are using currently for your for your paving operations. This is what rejuvenation does from a property standpoint. I'll focus on, on this part first because it highlights the principles of balanced mix design. We spoke about it uh, previously. Pick one property from column A, pick one property from column B. Uh, this is an almost 40% um, um, ABR type mix. Uh, just a quick clarification. 
In North America, there is a tradition of bituminous roofing materials, as is in some parts of Europe as well. So recycled asphalt shingle or reclaimed asphalt shingle is also a good source of used uh, uh, bitumen. Very stiff, but still usable. You got to be careful using it, but it is used in, in mixes. So it's about a 40% ABR to which 5.5% binder has been added. Case A, no rejuvenator. Case A, B with rejuvenator. And we're measuring overlay, Texas overlay, uh, interlaminar shear fatigue kind of a test uh, to assess the damage tolerance properties and APA rutting to look at the rutting properties. You can see the kind of balance we're trying to make here. Clearly, you're trying to improve the damage tolerance and take as minimal hit as minimal a hit as you can on the rutting so as to be able to meet the criteria here. The other area that I want to emphasize is this circle. In general, remember I told you uh, earlier, the more high wrap situations you start getting into and particularly with rejuvenation, you're asking more and more of that wrap binder to behave like virgin binder. So if you do not reduce your virgin binder when you're making high wrap mixes, you will tend to produce a very dense compaction. And this is stuff, by the way, guys, at least in the US, if you had this kind of a void volume, you're not getting paid for that job. So just a cautionary note, when you get into high wrap mixes, you need to consider how much of bitumen, virgin bitumen you're adding. You can't simply do business as usual. The uh, data on the left-hand side, just an introduction to data from, uh, from Asia, where there's a rich tradition of base course mixes having very high levels of wrap with rejuvenation. And they use martial stability and martial flow as their criteria for uh, for determination, fitness for use uh, type of criteria. So um, really wide variety of uh, techniques used. Um, one column A property, the stiffness, column B property, the ductility. That's really what you're trying to, to balance out. This, in a sense, is what balanced mixed design is all about. You can pick your own tests based on your own uh, lab availability based on your local specifications, but in general, you're looking to balance out these two properties as you make your mix design. Illinois Tollway, this is um, this is um, uh, uh, really a good cooperative effort between us, between universities, between uh, independent test labs, certainly between the Tollway Authority and contractors. Um, this is Illinois Tollway is a independent uh, 16 lane highway uh, um, you know, um, uh, um, a, a very big highway uh, carrying a lot of traffic, extremes of weather, uh, and they were looking at uh, high wrap mixes and qualification of, of uh, rejuvenators. This is a 50% ABR mix, 50% of the binder uh, is coming from recycled content. Uh, again, a couple of cases. Remember I told you one grade softer? A mix made with one grade softer. This is PG 46 minus 34. It's more common. The more common grade of bitumen used is PG 58 minus 28. So this column is uh, properties of, of the mix made with rejuvenator. Uh, and as you can see, they were looking at DCT as their fracture toughness, Hamburg as their rutting parameter, and trying to compare with specifications. Um, the added wrinkle here, Delta TC. I did indicate to you, and we'll have some more slides on this. It is almost mandatory, and, and we recommend this very highly, is that it's good to make a mix on day one and meet all the properties. You want to make sure that that mix is going to last as a function of time. So it's always good to have some kind of aging property embedded uh, in your qualification uh, regime or qualification routine. It could be simple bitumen level tests, uh, PAV aging or TFO aging, or it could be mix level test, loose mix oven aging, whatever works for you. It's always good to check the aging properties. So you can see um, here are the mix properties made with one grade softer. Here are the mix properties made with a, with a bio-based rejuvenator. Um, we put down well over uh, 20 lane miles, over six or seven days worth of production, 20 lane miles uh, before we uh, walked into uh, into their spec books as a qualified material. 
Um, they were not only pleased with the bio based rejuvenators, they asked us to increase the loading of the rejuvenator and put down some roadways because they wanted to tighten their specs in order to be able to meet better requirements. All of this is available in uh, uh, it was written up as a case study in Asphalt Pro magazine. Please check it out or uh, drop a line to Ranjit. He'd be happy to make a copy uh, available to you. <coughs> Excuse me. So far, we've been systematically looking at 20, 30, 40, 50 percent wrap. This is a case of 100 percent wrap. All there is in this mix is wrap and rejuvenator. No virgin bitumen added at all. Drum mix made in the plant, lab compacted using Marshall. Here are the stability and the flow um, numbers for, for the Marshall data. Put down roadways, and here is the aging part. Went back after about a year, extracted field cores, looked at SCB, semicircular beam bend, as a, fun, as a measure of our fracture toughness property and looked at Hamburg as a measure of rutting properties um, to help them put down um, really a spec. Um, so it is possible to go all the way up to 100% wrap, a, a very challenging manufacturing operation, but nevertheless can be done. And this is really the limiting case. If you ask yourself, you know, softer grade bitumen, for example, it will work fine, but there is just no way softer grade bitumen would be able to, in the dosage, uh, considerations used here be able to work in a situation like this. So all materials, all the rejuvenators that I that I listed previously, they have their pros and cons. They have their place um, as you begin to evaluate um, your options for rejuvenation. So far, and, and I said and I alluded to the fact that I'll come to this so far, we've been talking about mixed level properties on day one. How do these materials age? High wrap mixes with rejuvenation, how do they age? Again, a very busy chart. Let me take my time in explaining it. Here is ideal CT data, one of the measures of fracture toughness. We're looking at ideal CT data. We made a mix with no wrap and 5.5% virgin bitumen. Aged it. Loose mix of an aging, 4, 8, 16 hours. Measured the CT index, the predictable fall in, in CT numbers. Fracture toughness, as you may expect with aging. We took this data and we just put it here and compared it to two cases, both 30% wrap, both about 4% virgin bitumen. Case A, rejuvenated with a petrol oil, 5%. Case B, with a bio oil, 3%. What you can see is day one properties, the four hour aging properties of both are fairly similar um, to, to the material with no wrap whatsoever. It's only when you begin to age it do you start seeing changes. And the petrol oil rejuvenated sample does not quite show the same long term aging properties as does the uh, mix made with no wrap. This is true of both the 30 percent wrap case and the 50 percent wrap case. And I use this graph to point out that it is possible with the right mix design with the right rejuvenator, with the right rejuvenator selection, it is possible to make high wrap mixes that show performance similar to no wrap mixes. This is one of the key things that specifiers, DOT officials ask us around the world, and the answer is yes, and the devil is always in the details. So far, I, I, I walked you through the what, now let me walk you through the why. And this is a little bit uh, more academic than some of the people may like, but this really, this, this graph and the next one trace their origins to maybe 2010, 2011, and walk you through our thinking uh, as we set about creating a rejuvenator. What we did was we looked at various wrap materials through in different rejuvenators and tried to understand what, what are the genes of effective rejuvenation, if you will. And we're getting entirely different results until we realize wrap is not wrap is not wrap. So what we did, and a lot of this work was done at the University of Wisconsin, a tip of my hat to, to Professor Bahia here. What we did is we took virgin bitumen and artificially aged it, PAV aged it in the lab to simulate properties of five to seven year old wrap material gotten from 
roadways. We're using low temperature properties as a proxy here. Again, as I mentioned, you could use LAS, you could use frost breaking point, ductility, any measure you choose, roughly the results are the same. So we took virgin binder, we aged it artificially in the lab, PAV aged it to produce synthetic wrap binder. Now we have a highly controlled material to which we added 5% of each one of these oils just to assess the performance. Right away, you can see that this material is enormously dosage efficient. It gives you almost two grades of separation, 12 degrees of separation, uh, just for a 5% uh, addition. And so at first glance, it seems as though this is my rejuvenator of choice. Until you do one more step, you take each one of these materials and age it again to look at what would be the performance if this material was put down in a roadway five or seven years out. And that's this graph. The blue lines um, are, are from the previous chart. The gray lines are after aging of each of these materials, the second aging, if you will, of each of these materials. What you can see is that this material shows a very high degree of change. The delta is quite high. So what you're looking to do as you, as what we were looking to do as we created our rejuvenator was not only to preserve a high level of performance, this is about dosage efficiency, but also to reduce the delta, reduce the change. And this is really um, how we kind of sort of came up with our rejuvenator. And, and this is just maybe one uh, technique that you may want to consider um for for looking at this material by the way this is the kind of technical underpinning for the empirical observations of anderson uh, and company when they came up with their delta tc they looked at a large number of performance versus non-performing roadways and came up with a parameter called delta tc this is kind of sort of lays the technical underpinning for that empirical observation we spoke about delta tc what is it um, it's it's a test that is performed on aged materials, uh, PAV aged materials. You it's it's tested using a BBR, a bending beam rheometer, and you're looking for the difference between the stiffness and the compliance between the S value and the M value. Um, and here is a bitumen that was obtained for a refinery. We did went through the process and came up with a delta TC of minus 5.4. We took one grade softer from the same refinery and performed the same delta TC measurement and came up with minus 11. We took this material, rejuvenated it with a bio-based rejuvenator and came up with a pretty similar minus five uh, kind of read. So it does matter. You should ask yourself this question. It does matter how the refiner was able to achieve his softer bitumen. And then, you know, as, as you go through your process, you need to be able to ask these kinds of critical questions. What is my input raw material into the process? Remember, like wrap, like aggregate, like virgin bitumen, softer bitumen is also an input material into your process, and you need to characterize it to make sure that it meets your requirements. So with that, let me uh, switch gears and move on to, to, to some economic impact cases. This is actual NAPA data. And NAPA is, um, is, a, is a paving association um, uh, that is comprised of, uh, in, of North American. Uh, it's comprised of, its members comprise the local state uh, paving associations, plus users, plus producers, and so on and so forth. They polled their uh, member audience and came up with, this is actual data. This is not hypothetical or made up data. The, they, they were able to demonstrate uh, that there was almost a $3.4 billion saving in material costs. And more importantly, there was also about a five and a half billion savings uh, in 2019 year uh, in disposal fees. Not only that, they were able to calculate back uh, that they saved about 2.25 million metric tons of carbon dioxide emissions. So this is actual data. How do we get this? So let's look at that question. Why does high mix, high wrap mixes with rejuvenation help reduce costs? Here are two cases. In the control mix, you've got about 15% wrap. Remember the black rock concept, no rejuvenator. In this mix, you've got 40% wrap with a smidgen of rejuvenator. 
and these are again, um, I'll point out your mileage may vary as the auto companies like to say this is based on your assumptions of input raw material costs for aggregate for bitumen for everything else. But in general, as you and as the previous data showed, as you force more and more of your wrap bitumen to start behaving like virgin bitumen through rejuvenation, you're able to cut down on rejuvenator use. Not only are you cutting down on aggregate, mining of aggregate, but you're also cutting down on virgin bitumen. And that is what leads to this cost reduction, anywhere from five to 15%, depending on your experiences, depending on your level of wrap addition, depending on your assumptions about input raw material costs. This is the underpinning that leads to the previous chart. <coughs> so we've done all of this. We've made the mix. We've analyzed the economic impact. We've checked the properties both on day one as well as some kind of aging properties. Now you're ready to implement in a plant. What do you do? This, this section is geared more towards the plant manager or the quality manager in the in the plant. So as I mentioned before, um, the treat la wrap like any input material um, into your process. If you simply look at it as garbage, well, garbage in, garbage out. So you do need to have a consistent gradation. Uh, this step is important. You need to minimize the, the fines uh, uh, in the wrap, the dust in the wrap, uh, because they basically act as sinks for, for bitumen absorption. Um, Universally, now I'll spend a moment on this. Wrap preheating is generally required. Why do I say that? Well, if you're using 10, 15, 20% wrap, then maybe it doesn't act as that much of a, of a heat sink. But if you're starting to, to put in 30, 40, 50, 60% wrap, now it is a sizable chunk of your incoming batch. And therefore, in order to, to minimize residence time in a drum, minimize residence time in a pug mill, um, you need to be able to preheat the wrap. Moisture content in the wrap is also very important. I tell folks all the time, put a tarp on your wrap piles. And the reason again is, is very simple. Moisture, uh, and many of you probably have practical experience of this. In general, it is true that if your wrap is wet, let's say you were running 40% wrap all day long yesterday, there was some rains overnight and your wrap is wet today, you may only be able to run 20 or 25% wrap today. Why is that? Well, because you've got to drive off the moisture. The moisture not only needs to be brought up to temperature, but you need to provide the latent heat of vaporization, which is a big chunk. And so moisture um, in wrap should be monitored, controlled, and certainly analyze the wrap. You need to know what your incoming wrap looks like. What's the bitumen content? What is the grade of that or, or the quality parameters of the incoming wrap? It varies. Wrap from, like I said, from the same roadway a few more kilometers down the road, it may be quite different uh, than the wrap that that um, that that you obtain from a few kilometers ahead. So make sure you analyze your wrap periodically. Make sure that your input raw material uh, is controlled. How much? Krishna, your, your mic has gone muted. Sorry, can you hear me? We can hear you now. Good. Where did you lose me, Gordon? Oh, only 10, 10, 10 seconds, 10, 15 seconds. OK, I'll repeat. How much can your how much plant can your wrap handle? The answer depends on 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 you. You know, it depends on your equipment, depends on your situation depends on your specifications depends on what your preference is from an environmental point from a cost point and so many other factors Ugh. okay um i'm an old plan manager so i will um, at least put up some of the issues that you may want to consider from an environmental health and safety standpoint does it have an order? Does it have any volatile organic compounds? This is all up to you entirely. Does it lower my GHG? Um, is it hazardous to transport? Does it require special PPE to use? Is it a low viscosity material that's readily flowable at, at ambient conditions? Is it stable for mix, for use, for storage? So any number of factors that you may want to consider 
uh, as you choose your uh, your rejuvenator. Not all of them apply. Again, your experiences may vary. Having done that, how would you incorporate it in a plant? And the answer again, depending on the type of rejuvenator, is you could possibly introduce it at many points. Again, it all depends on on whether it's free flowing, whether it's non toxic, and and things like that. You could treat your wrap on conveyor, a challenging operation, but nevertheless can be done and certainly must be done in the case of 100% wrap. If you, all you're doing is making 40% wrap mixes all day long for three weeks in a row, you could just dose your bitumen tank, stir it, and away you go. If you're making different wrap mixes, 30% for six hours, 60% for the next eight hours, and so on and so forth, you need a little bit more flexibility. And there, you could use a variable pump to co-inject it into the bitumen line as it is feeding your drum mix or as it is feeding your pugman. That option is also available. Any number of equipment manufacturers make those kinds of pumps that can be tied into the PLC of your plant operation. We do help uh, customers uh, across the globe. Some have drum mixers, some have pug mills, um, and the point here is not to spend too much time on it other than to say that there are options available depending on how much wrap you're using uh, in terms of what operations you can do and what some of the benefits are. Uh, this is a topic in and of itself, so we'll probably skip it. And just to point out that there are adjustments possible for batch mix plants in the same way in which there are adjustments available for drum mix plants. So quite a, uh, a versatile material, rejuvenators are quite a versatile material uh, that can be introduced. If you're doing warm mix or if you're adding anti-strip, adding a rejuvenator to that op operation is, is not that much different. Wow, somebody is really quick on the trigger here. So with that, let's move. Um, remember when I told you, we, you know, these were all uh, responses just to to aid us um, in, in tailoring a better presentation for our audience? Um, well, I think I lied. Uh, I think uh, Gordon would be severely disappointed if, um, if we had a 30 to 40 minute uh, presentation with no pop quiz at the end. So here is your pop quiz. Please pick up to three answers. Um, and actually, I'm kidding. Um, as you go through this list, I hope this presentation has made it clear to you. There are no right answers. There are no wrong answers. All of the above is also an acceptable answer. So it really depends on your point of view, what parameters, which part of the globe you're in. You know, it, 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 it all depends on what your particular situation is. Um, and and I can see a, a really overwhelming uh, number of folks in the room seem to think aging performance is important. That is a sea change. That really is a sea change from maybe uh, five or six years ago when rejuvenation um, in the early um, uh, life of, of rejuvenation of high wrap mixes. Initially, it was all about just soften that mix, make sure it can compact on the on the roadway, and away we go. Slowly, as I as I hope to have pointed out to you. The thinking has evolved. Um, you're looking for better materials. The, the purpose is not to simply put something down and come to fix it um, You know, every few years. You need to make durable roadways, rutting performance, fracture toughness, fatigue properties. Okay, that's that too is important. Fatigue and fracture go hand in hand um, in, in many instances. Certainly they're, um, I guess, different cousins uh, from the same family tree. Very good. Um, I see very few people have pointed out air voids or compaction, and that's always a good sign because, well, you know, it, it's important. By the way, don't don't misunderstand me. It's very important to put down a good roadway. Your mix is only as good as your compaction technique. But um, as I mentioned to you, um, you need to pay close attention to the air voids when you're making high wrap mixes with rejuvenation. You cannot overdose that liquid. Um, that that uh, mix with with liquids. Just be cautious of that. Uh, make sure you you include that as one of your parameters as you cycle through factors important to you in determining the dosage level. Thank you very much. Um, and with that, uh, let me uh, provide some some quick closing remarks. Um, really, high wrap mixes are becoming uh, much more commonplace around the world. Initially, they were a curiosity, and people wanted to to understand more, learn more. Increasingly, 
Rejuvenation and high rap mixes are becoming more and more commonplace. Um, I hope to have demonstrated to you that through um, your, your mix selection, through your dosage selection, through your rejuvenator selection, you can create mixes that are similar to what you were doing 5, 10, 15 years ago with no wrap or, or low wrap. Um, high wrap mixes are very economical. You need to control the incoming material, obviously um, correct binder dosage, correct uh, aggregate uh, selection. All of that is very, very critical. Um, and what I did not touch upon in great detail today, um, because it's really a point of differentiation, uh, is that not all rejuvenators give similar kinds of performance. So as you cycle through the various rejuvenators that I laid up um, in, in one of the previous slides, make sure you check out all the properties and make sure uh, that you are getting your money's worth. Please don't hesitate to contact us uh, for more information. Uh, here are some um, people to contact if you want a copy of the presentation. Um, this is a slide that tells you in the end, lawyers rule the world. Um, this is our standard disclaimer statement. Um, um, so I'll let it flash for a moment or two. Um, and with that, Gordon, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity. I hope uh, I have uh, given you guys some food for thought. And with that, I will turn the mic over back to you. Thanks, Krishna. That was, that was an excellent and, and very, very informative presentation.